of women who inspire at the forefront of healthcare. As we see the participant ticker going up, uh, we'll get started because it is one o'clock and uh, I'm delighted to uh, talk about, uh, introduce the speakers and moderator for today's uh, webinar. But before we do that, let me tell you what we will be discussing, yeah. which is the broadening our understanding of contact tracing during COVID-19. Uh, please uh, uh, make sure to uh, mute your, your uh, um, phones and devices if you don't mind, that'll be great. Uh, we invite and encourage all of you, the audience, to ask provocative questions and generate great ideas. Before I introduce the speakers and moderator, I would like to recognize the work of the planning committee uh, in our with our development team. Uh, and uh, I will ask also our colleague Crosby and Wright to please just go over the uh, details, logistics of the webinar, please. Thanks so much, Carmen. Welcome, everybody. As we settle in, we just wanted to share a few best practices and notes for this event. The first is that we are recording this and the recording will be circulated afterwards. Additionally, we are approved to provide one contact hour of nursing CE credit for the event through Northeastern University School Health Academy. Northeastern University School Health Academy operates within Northeastern University School of Nursing, an accredited provider of continuing nursing education by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. The planners and presenters of this program have no conflicts of interest to declare. Individual speakers will disclose any potential conflict prior to the presentation and note commercial support has been provided for this program. Instructions for obtaining your certificate will be emailed to you tomorrow along with the recording and a post event survey. To assist us with taking attendance, we ask that you please try to list your first and last name in the participants window. If you've joined from another device such as a family member's iPad or iPhone, you may need to rename yourself. I'll post instructions in the chat window, and if you can't access this feature for whatever reason, you're welcome to message me privately in the chat with your first and last name. To raise a question or comment during the presentation, please use the chat window. You can type your question or comment there at any time, and we'll address it during the Q&A portion of the second half of the event. I will be monitoring the chat window and reading out the questions in the order in which they're received. When your question or comment is raised, you're welcome to unmute yourself at that time if you'd like to add on. As a courtesy, please remain muted throughout unless it's your time to speak. You're welcome to leave your webcam on for the duration. It'd be great to see everybody's faces, however you do not need to. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dean Sheppa and our presenters. Thank you, Crosby. And with the excitement of getting started, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Carmen Sheppa, Dean of the Bouvet College of Health Sciences. So let me now introduce our speakers and moderator. And these are Meredith Patterson, uh, who is our uh, alum and also student in the MPH program, uh, class of 21. And she is the care resource coordinator with the Massachusetts Community Tracing Collaborative. And she'll tell you more about what she's doing. Uh, Magda Panko Pankos Pankowska uh, is, um, has just recently or graduated in the BSMPH program and is volunteer with the Academic Public Health Volunteer Course. Cassie Bichain, who will be joining us uh, in another few minutes, is a JV MPH class of 21. And she is also volunteer with the Acad uh, Academic Public Health Volunteer Course. And our moderator to the, today uh, is Professor Neil Maniar, who is the director of the MPH program and co-leader uh, and really, you know, creator in, uh, uh, of the Academic Public uh, Health Volunteer Corps. So without further ado, I'll turn it to Dr. Maniar uh, to lead us through this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Shreppa, for that very warm introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure uh, to be here uh, this afternoon and to have the opportunity to hear from um, you know, three of our uh, amazing um, student and alumni leaders um, who really uh, answered the call to action to help respond to the COVID-19 crisis at the local level um, during a very critical moment um, of, this, of, of the pandemic. Um, so the focus for today's talk will be on contact tracing. Um, so what I will do is just give a very brief overview uh, shortly about what contact tracing is, and then our, our um, panel members will go into much more depth 
um, about contact tracing and the work that they've done and um, the opportunities and, and some of the limitations that um, are associated with contact tracing. I just want to give a little bit of background in terms of how we um, were asked to respond um, as uh, public health programs uh, in, the, in the early stages of this pandemic. Um, so back in mid-March, um, so March 19th uh, specifically, the governor um, through the COVID-19 Command Center, which is out of the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, convened eight of us and we were all, uh, we were all the, the directors of the eight accredited public health programs and schools of public health in Massachusetts. Uh, so we were convened along with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, um, the Massachusetts Health Officers Association, which uh, has contacts with all of the local health departments, and the Massachusetts Public Health Association. Um, so we were convened by the governor and we were uh, tasked with coming up with a way to help local health departments respond to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, here in Massachusetts, we have 351 communities and we have 351 local boards of health um, because we have a decentralized local public health system. So that meant that we really had to figure out, you know, how do we do this? How do we come up with something where, you know, we can help all of these different local departments that are already stretched very thin and that we knew were going to be, going to be stretched well beyond their limits um, as this crisis further, uh, further unraveled. So uh, over the course of that weekend, uh, there were a group of us who met and um, we, we, the one thing that was very clear is that across the schools and programs of public health, we have an amazing group of students and we have an amazing group of alumni who um, were really eager to answer the call to action, who were really eager to leverage their expertise and their knowledge to help respond to this crisis. So um, over the course of 48 hours, we formed the Academic Public Health Volunteer Corps. Uh, so we informed the governor that Monday that this is what the response was going to be, that we were going to form this volunteer corps. On Wednesday of that, uh, that following, that Wednesday, so a few days later, we put out the call for volunteers and within 24 hours, we had 700 volunteers sign up. Within a few days, we had over a thousand and by the end of one week, we had 2,000 volunteers sign up, including well over 100 from Northeastern. Uh, so these volunteers were deployed into local departments of health um, to initially assist with contact tracing um, because that was the primary need at the time. So we were focusing on contact tracing and we were focusing on language translation because many of our volunteers had uh, fluency uh, in a number of different languages. So we wanted to make sure that we leveraged that. So initially the contact tracing work was based out of our academic public health volunteer corps. And that's, you'll hear from uh, both Magda and Cassie on the work that they did as one of the first teams, in fact, the very first team uh, deployed into a community to do this work. Literally two weeks after we launched this effort, we had launched the first team into, this, uh, in, into the community. Um, that was March. In April, part, as many of you have, uh, have heard, Partners in Health in, in partnership with the state and in partnership with Accenture um, and uh, Salesforce uh, stood up the Community Tracing Collaborative. So by the end of April, our contact tracing efforts had shifted from the Public Health Core to the Community Tracing Collaborative. And that's the work that you'll hear from uh, Meredith about who, and Meredith is uh, participating in this Community Tracing Collaborative. Um, so contact tracing has you know, proved to be a, a really uh, vitally important tool uh, to help us respond to the crisis, to help us mitigate the spread of this pandemic. And it is widely uh, viewed as a, as a very important mechanism. So what is contact tracing? And I'll just give a very short description of contact tracing. Um, contact tracing is essentially identifying, notifying, and monitoring anyone who has come into contact. Um, or close contact with someone who um, has tested positive for COVID-19. So what this enables us to do is when we know somebody has tested positive, we're able to identify everyone who has been in close contact and who may have the potential for being infected with uh, COVID-19. And we reach out, the contact tracers are able to reach out to those individuals, make sure that those individuals are uh, connected with testing. Um, they're first notified that they had a potential exposure they're referred for testing, and then they're monitors, monitored to see if they develop signs and symptoms for COVID. 
Um, the other piece around contact tracing is that we want to make sure that contacts who um, are uh, approached through this work, that they are also connected with services that they might need during this self-quarantine period. Because individuals who, um, are, uh, who do test positive um, or who, who have come in close contact are asked to self-quarantine for 14 days um, or until uh, you know, there's, uh, no, there are no symptoms. Um, so that's a very brief overview of what contact tracing is. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as we heard many times from the governor and others, you know, testing and tracing are two of our, our best mechanisms for making sure that we're able to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. And as we all know, and as we're very fortunate here in Massachusetts, we've done exceptionally well. Um, and I, I hope all of us are knocking on wood at this moment, but, um, you know, we're, we're doing pretty well uh, relative to much of the country right now in terms of uh, the spread of COVID-19 uh, in Massachusetts. And I think that's because people are adhering to the public health recommendations. So, um, so with that, um, I want to uh, turn it over to uh, the two panel members. So um, I will, uh, you know, um, Magda and Meredith, if you could just uh, take a moment to introduce yourself and uh, uh, you can decide who wants to go first, uh, introduce yourself. And if you could describe a little bit about what you either worked on or are currently working on with regard to contact tracing and related activities. I see the floor is yours, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, thank you for being us with here virtually and, and thank you also to our Bouvet leadership for organizing uh, the Women Who Inspire series. Uh, my name is Meredith Patterson. I am in the BSMPH program here at Northeastern. So I recently graduated with a bachelor's degree in health science and I'll graduate in this spring with a master's degree in public health. Um, and I have served as a care resource coordinator with the Massachusetts COVID-19 Community Tracing Collaborative. Um, and throughout our presentation, we'll refer to this collaborative as the CTC. So in this position, uh, I've helped connect vulnerable COVID positive cases and their contacts with the resources they need to isolate or quarantine safely and successfully. So my team works specifically with folks in Brockton, Chelsea, Revere, and Everett, uh, which are among the, the hardest hit locations in Massachusetts. And I also work with folks in Cambridge and Somerville. And so the CTC estimates that approximately 10 to 15% of the cases and contacts we uh, talk to are referred to a care resource coordinator. Um, so we've been in contact with many, many vulnerable folks throughout Massachusetts. Most requests um, are for food, medication, PPE, and cleaning supplies in order to keep people as healthy as possible. But we also see a lot of complicated needs as well, um, including needs for housing for folks experiencing homelessness who are COVID positive, um, needs for uh, accessing care, helping people access mental health services, um, and many needs like that. So overall, my role as a resource coordinator allows cases and contacts to isolate and quarantine in order to keep others from getting sick. Um, and that in turn supports more traditional contact tracing efforts, uh, which Magda can speak to. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Magda Pankowska. Um, I recently graduated from Northeastern's uh, combined Bachelor's of Science and Master of Public Health program um, very recently in May. Uh, currently, I work as a data analyst uh, at Boston Medical Center. Um, I work on research aiming to identify opportunities uh, to improve healthcare delivery and quality of life among cancer patients. Um, like Neil said, uh, since March, I've been working uh, as a volunteer with the Academic Public Health Volunteer Corps. Uh, as part of the first uh, in the nation response uh, to take on contact tracing as a statewide initiative. Um, I was part of the first volunteer team to actually get deployed and work on the ground, um, assisting a local health department in a small town in southeastern Massachusetts uh, with case management and case interviewing, uh, which came with a lot of kind of learning on the go um, to, to try to improve our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, more recently, uh, I moved to a team uh, assisting the Somerville Health Department uh, there, I get to work with a team of uh, almost 30 volunteers, uh, contacting individuals with their COVID-19 diagnostic test results uh, in multiple languages, and also providing them um, with crucial public health guidance, uh, such as the importance of washing your hands or wearing a mask, 
uh, differences between diagnostic and antibody test results, uh, and the possibility of test results being false negatives. Um, and I'm very excited to be part of this very timely conversation. I look forward to everyone's questions. Uh, and I also believe Cassie's on the call, so I could kind of uh, move it over to her. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with everyone today. Um, my name is Cassie, and I am a JD MPH student um, at Northeastern, both in Northeastern University School of Law and the Bouvet College of Health Sciences MPH program. I believe I'm actually um, Bouvet's first JD MPH student ever. Yeah. Um, so this has been a great educational experience for me. Um, I will finish in December of 2021, so I still have about a year and a half left. Um, my experience with contact tracing has pretty much mirrored um, Magda's. We were part of the same team um, in March, um, helping with case management in um, a small town in Massachusetts. And I think we switched over to Somerville um, around the same time. Um, <laughs> so I don't have that much to add um, to what Magda said about what we've been working on. Um, but another thing that we have been doing when delivering people's um, COVID-19 test results is also asking people um, what resources they might need um, in order to make sure that someone gets into contact with them to help with resources as well. Great. Thank you. Um, so, as, and that's a great segue into, into one of my first questions, which is, so from your perspective, as you think about the impact that you've been able to um, achieve through contact tracing, um, what are some of the benefits of contact tracing, particularly um, at the level of local health departments and assisting local health departments as they try to respond to, um, to a pandemic such as the one we're currently in the middle of? Um, and Cassie, we'll start with you for the response to that. Sure. Um, well, I think we all know that the broad um, benefit is keeping track of who's infected and helping um, let people know if they've been in contact with someone so that they can quarantine and just slow the spread overall. But I think what really helps um, local boards of health is that a lot of times they're really small, maybe only a couple of employees um, for small towns. So this really helps identify what is happening in a local community, what the risk is to the local community, and what resources are needed, um, and how local communities can come together and um, help everyone get through this. Great, thank you. Um, Magda, Meredith. Sure. Um, so it, it, in terms of contact tracing, it is unreasonable in, in some respect to call people, tell them they're COVID positive or they've been in contact with someone who is COVID positive to, and then drop everything and isolate in your home. Most people are not prepared for that and many people cannot be prepared for that due to uh, economic reasons, social reasons, uh, environmental reasons. Um, and so that's where care resource coordination comes in. And that's where care resource coordination supports and assists local health departments and local boards of health in slowing the spread of disease. If you are looking for people to drop everything to keep all of us safe collectively, you need to provide them the support and the resources they need. And again, that's where care resource coordination comes in to really support local health departments when they may otherwise be overwhelmed by cases that are unable to isolate at home. They're unable to quarantine um, for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of people walk a, a razor thin line um, and, and one diagnosis with COVID-19 pushes them over that line to a place where they really need um, resources and support um, out from outside of their local health department. And so we really work in conjunction with local boards of health and health departments um, in getting people the resources they need um, and to be able to slow that spread, especially in our most vulnerable populations. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, Meredith and Cassie's point kind of mirror kind of my first thought uh, about why I even decided to join the volunteer corps um, is the fact that we are reducing the workloads of local health departments. 
um, the way we kind of got involved with calling people with their testing results was that was the need of that health department and that's what they were just being overwhelmed with. Um, so it just feels like we kind of fill in the gaps of like where they just need um, the most help with in terms of like volumes of calls uh, and kind of providing people with correct information. Um, and I think we also, since Cassie and I were kind of the first team really on the ground, it really came with a lot of kind of trying to figure out the best kind of day-to-day -day operations and even the nitty gritty of like, how are we calling people? Are we using Google Voice to kind of make sure we reach them because um, they're more likely um, to answer one of our calls we were calling from a Massachusetts number, um, how we kind of make a system where we're calling people to give them results and making sure we're at the correct times, uh, and then also kind of forming um, the best kind of language to kind of um, give people the correct information once they have uh, a test result so they kind of know next steps. Um, so it's kind of a very um, kind of learning process uh, as we go along. Great, thank you. And um, you know, one thing I should mention, uh, for, for the audience in terms of just an additional background component, because some of you may be wondering how, how is it that um, we first landed on contact tracing um, as the, the primary focus for the Academic Public Health Volunteer Corps. Um, and one of the things that we did in those uh, first probably 72 hours um, when the Corps was being formed uh, was we sent a survey out to all of the local boards of health through the Mass Health Officers Association asking the local boards of health what they saw as the most, most critical needs. And recognizing the fact that these needs were probably going to change over time, um, but they had highlighted contact tracing as their single most important need or as one of their most important needs, along with um, language translation um, and another area that they saw um, as being uh, very important as well was around wellness checks um, with vulnerable populations in the community, especially because everyone is socially isolated. Um, so the, the work that, um, that Magda and Cassie spoke of and the work that Meredith spoke of uh, was in direct response to um, what the local boards of health had identified as, as their most pressing need. Um, so thinking about the, the work that you've done um, and, and the work that you're currently doing, what are some of the biggest challenges with contact tracing? Maybe Meredith, we'll start with you. Or I can start. Um, there are a couple of challenges um, that I can speak to from, from a resource and a resource coordination perspective. Um, you know, the first challenge that I think all of us are aware of is that, you know, it's something we saw even during the Black Plague, during the AIDS epidemic, and we see it now, we see a widespread assignment of blame for, for the virus on, on the other in our society. Um, and so one of the, the challenges is kind of in your conversations with cases and contacts in your work on a daily basis is how do we overcome that mindset um, of blaming the virus on minority groups and on the other. Um, and so something that uh, Partners in Health, which works in the CTC has done is really um, made an effort to a diverse workforce um, that's able to speak from diverse standpoints um, and also just uh, giving cases and contacts accurate information um, so that people are knowledgeable um, and more accepting of this disease for what it is. Um, and so that's one of the challenges we've seen. Um, another challenge I've seen as a resource coordinator um, is the need to connect people with resources that they feel are acceptable and appropriate for them. And that's where our partnerships with local boards of health, uh, community health centers, other local professionals and healthcare workers comes into play. Um, people want and need resources that are culturally and linguistically appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's necessary to work very closely with people in communities in order to get people those resources, it can be very harmful um, and something challenging to overcome to have sort of a one size fits all mindset when it comes to resources and when it comes to the situations of COVID positive cases and their contacts. Um, we need to, and it's a challenge to work with people on the ground in communities to really uh, hone in on what 
individual communities need, what individual community members need in terms of culturally and linguistically appropriate services and resources. And that's something that we are continuously improving because it's a continuously changing challenge. Thank you. Uh, Magda. Yeah, I really love that you brought up the idea of having linguistically um, kind of appropriate resources. I think that's the first kind of a uh, challenge that I thought of when uh, Neil asked us a question um, was about the fact that when we are providing people with both their test results, guidance on kind of next steps after the test results, uh, it's kind of the language barriers. Uh, we really try to make sure that we're contacting people in their primary language, uh, meaning that I feel like a lot of the volunteers uh, that speak maybe Spanish or Portuguese are doing a very large volume of calls uh, to make sure that um, the individuals that we are contacting are getting the appropriate information in their um, primary language. Um, I think the second challenge that really comes to mind uh, that I really didn't really think of uh, until I started volunteering uh, with the Somerville Health Department uh, is that I think um, a big part of um, communicating uh, results back to people is making sure that we're communicating very rapidly. Um, people shouldn't be waiting like long periods of time between getting tested and getting uh, kind of communication about what the results are and what kind of next steps be taking um because i do feel like it not only makes people kind of anxious and stressed out but also kind of making sure uh, that when people do test positive they are able to either isolate or kind of steps um kind of mitigate that um and i think the third challenge uh, which i kind of touched upon uh, is kind of the anxiety comes with waiting for results um i have a lot of calls uh, where family members get tested together and they want their results and their daughter's results results and I think I can just kind of feel feel that anxiety kind of through the phone um, regardless of whether it's a positive or negative result. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, Cassie, uh, challenges from your perspective? I think um, so far Meredith and Magda have both brought up very true and very important challenges. Um, there are a couple of additional just like practical challenges that I think we had, especially when we first started earlier, um, Magda brought up deciding if we were going to use our own phone numbers or something like Google Voice. And I definitely found that um, a lot of people don't answer their phones. Um, I don't answer my phone to a phone number that I don't recognize. So that makes complete sense. Um, and as well, there's a lot of information that we are trying to um, share with people in terms of even if someone's result is negative, um, they can still get infected um, at a later date. They're, it's not a free pass or that they're like completely safe from ever getting COVID-19 or spreading it. Um, and a lot of people, when they get a negative result, they're just like relieved and don't really want to be on the phone anymore. But we have quite a bit of um, information that we are supposed to be and are really trying to communicate to people. So balancing that has also been difficult. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and it's interesting. So uh, we're now you know, fortunately here um, in, in our Commonwealth uh, experiencing a, a little bit of calm water uh, with respect to COVID-19 and um, have the opportunity to reflect on the work that's been done and, and learn from uh, some of the challenges that have been encountered with respect to contact tracing and other efforts to address the pandemic um, and also uh, think about how we can expand on the opportunities and uh, the things that have worked. So from your perspective, um, what advice do you have as we prepare for the fall, uh, both here on campus and, and across the Commonwealth um, to you know, kind of resume um, activity uh, in the midst of an ongoing pandemic. Um, so uh, advice in terms of, you know, contact tracing, advice in terms of other, um, you know, other things that you've seen or learned as, as you've done this work and this incredibly important and timely work to address the pandemic. I can start on this one. Um, I, I think there are, there are two things that I um, would advise going forward. The first is just continuing um, a, a community mindset to addressing this virus and sort of promoting this sense of camaraderie, both within uh, the CDC and the volunteer corps and also in our communities, um, thinking about this as something that affects all of us and not just um, 
certain populations of us um, and working together to, to address this issue is gonna be really important. Um, and also, again, from a resource coordination perspective, um, such a unique focus on care resource coordination is not the case in many other states' response efforts, the way it is in Massachusetts. Um, and the success of the CTC and the Volunteer Corps and the overall response in Massachusetts, um, you know, could be in large part uh, because of resource coordination and on the provision of support for cases and contacts. Um, and going forward, it's something we'll have to figure out economically and logistically, how do we make sure in every state there is a contact tracing and care resource coordination effort as extensive as the one in Massachusetts? Because we've seen um, that these efforts have been successful. Um, and so, you know, from a national perspective, um, that's definitely something we have to keep in mind is how do we, you know, have sort of equity in, in response throughout the states. Great. Thank you. Uh, Magda, Cassie? Yeah, I'd be happy to go. I feel uh, I very much agree with Meredith's point about kind of focusing on the logistics and the, like kind of smooth operation of the way uh, we're approaching um, kind of contact tracing. Uh, and I'm no Dr. Fauci, but um, I feel like some of the biggest things that I want to emphasize is that we need kind of smooth operation, not just to get people like the actual testing, like the swab up their nose, uh, but then also make sure that that's being sent to a facility within a certain time frame and that's being turned around. Um, and then the test is, tests are the kids, people who have been tested within a rapid kind of time frame. Um, I think just doing things in a, like a way that's kind of smooth up and kind of rapidly done, I think is very, very important. One way that we've been doing that with the Somerville Health Department uh, is trying to get more people to sign up uh, with like electronic uh, medical records with like MyChart uh, as like an app where you can uh, see your test result kind of virtually. Uh, so then we don't have to call you uh, multiple times sure like you get your test result that you can like just see it online uh, within like a very short. Great, thank you. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of um, schools, both universities and public schools um, reopening, both myself as a student and um, my mom is a public school teacher. Um, so there's a lot of concern for me with both of those. Um, I think something that's really important in terms of both testing and contact tracing is to make sure that in an effort to push to reopen, resources aren't being taken away from surrounding communities. Um, so testing capacity nationwide still isn't um, as robust as possibly it could be. Um, and there are a lot of schools implementing procedures where people are going to be swabbed and tested fairly regularly. So I'm worried that that might take away testing capacity and contact tracing capacity from um, local communities, vulnerable communities. Um, additionally, we also have to keep in mind that um, not everyone necessarily like lives on campus. So there are a lot of things being put into place um, about controlling when people enter and leave campus and checking in and checking out. You know, most grad students I know don't live on campus and take public transportation to campus to their classes every day. So I think that there are a lot of moving pieces that need to be taken into consideration um, and monitored really closely as things start to reopen. Great. Thank you for that. I'm really glad that this session is being recorded because we can, the, the advice that all three of you um, just provided us with will be really helpful as we are um, as, as all of us are actively working to uh, prepare for the fall. Um, so I, I know we have several questions in the chat box as well for the panel members. Um, so Crosby, uh, how, um, how should we tackle the questions in the chat box? Yeah, definitely. Thank you all so much. And thank you, everybody, for the really wonderful questions. Um, I think we can just kind of get started, switch over to Q&A. What I'll do is I'm going to read out the questions in the order received. We'll give our speakers a chance to um, address, and then we'll just go from there. And we'll do our best to get through as many of these as possible. 
All right, so our first question is from um, Laura Sainier, and she writes, I would love to know more about the demographic characteristics of those who have been trained as contact tracers. So anybody looked at age, race, gender, educational attainment, geographic distribution, and can any of this, this inform efforts to build a more diverse public health workforce in the future? It's a great question. And just um, before the panel members jump in, just want to give uh, one additional piece of background in terms of uh, a difference between the two, the Academic Public Health Volunteer Corps and the Community Tracing Collaborative Effort. So uh, the Academic Public Health Volunteer Corps was uh, entirely volunteer-based, um, largely uh, or almost entirely comprised of uh, public health students and public health alums um, from uh, 12 different programs. So, um, so that was a volunteer-based effort. The CTC, um, they hired individuals to be contact tracers and to fill the different positions in the community tracing collaborative. So they had a different process that was put in place to um, go through the hiring process. Um, so it'd be great to hear from both perspectives um, about the, this question. So I'll hand it over to the panel. Yeah, I can speak um, about the CTC, um, which functions with a partnership with Partners in Health. Um, and Partners in Health is a nonprofit organization that has always been very um, devoted to racial equity in health, gender equity in health, um, um, in similar pursuits. Um, so there are, um, systems in place within the CTC to ensure that there is a diverse workforce. Um, I don't have specific data about that, um, but I'm sure that specific data is available um, about the CTC in that respect. Um, but there, there are um, dedicated efforts um, to ensure the diversity of, of the workforce um, in order to match the diversity of the folks that we're calling and, and we're in contact with on a daily basis. Great. Thank you. I think that's a really great question. Again, similar to Meredith, I don't have access to that data for the um, uh, Academic Volunteer Corps. Uh, I think that's kind of more on the higher level than us volunteers are involved, but really great question. Yeah, I, I, I could give a little bit of background just in terms of um, what we saw uh, regarding the volunteers who did sign up. Um, while we did not have, we didn't have, you know, I, I think as a function of the fact that uh, the volunteers in the academic uh, vol public health volunteer corps were largely current students, and then we had many alum uh, alumna who alumni who had signed up as well. Because for many of us, um, we sent out the notification to our list of alumni as well. Um, so we didn't have as much age um, diversity with respect to age, but we did have quite a bit of diversity with respect to race, ethnicity, and language, and. Um, and the language piece in particular, we probably, gosh, I want to say we had about two dozen different languages that were represented. And we were actually able to, as a result, um, address some really pressing needs um, at the local level to translate materials into different languages. Um, and you know, for example, there was a situation in Lowell um, back in late March where they were putting up, rapidly putting up a testing site. And they had to translate the materials within less than 24 hours. Um, into um, Hmong and there were like three different languages that we had to translate materials into. And we were able to call on volunteers who had the, uh, those um, areas of language fluency and those volunteers were able to translate the materials literally in less than one day so that they were able to assist with the development of this testing site. Um, so we did have diversity from that perspective, but um, the question is a really important one. And I think it's one that is I'm receiving a lot of attention right now as well, because as we think about the importance of uh, these types of efforts as you know, um, important opportunities to build a diverse pipeline into public health, it's, it is something that we're, we're thinking a lot about. And you know, certainly for something like the CTC where they're hiring folks, it's a, it's a really important consideration. Um, Cassie, did you um, have anything to add for the response to this question? Um, no, I mean, like Meredith and Magda, I don't think I'm quite at the level to have um, access to the data on that. Got it. No, no worries. Um, next question, I guess. Right, so we're moving along. So next we have uh, Jenny Gormley and Jenny's curious to hear if you've been collaborating with Massachusetts school nurses. We estimate that 500 to 1000 school nurses 
assisting local boards of health with contact tracing when school buildings close, in addition to connecting with students and families with chronic health conditions on remote health teaching strategies for reducing transmission. As far as the CTC goes, um, I don't know specifically about school nurses, um, but something we've been doing is um, recruiting from uh, community health centers in communities. Um, so we've brought in uh, several teams for contact tracing within the CTC that um, have transitioned from their roles in a community health center to a temporary role as a contact tracing team. Um, so I can't speak to school nurses in particular, but many um, healthcare professionals in the community have been transitioning roles uh, to aid in contact tracing efforts within the CTC. Um, so it's possible that something similar has been done with school nurses, um, but I can't say um, specifically whether they have or not. All right, um, Magda, Cassie, if there's nothing else to add there. Similar to my last question, uh, last question, I'm really not sure about kind of the higher level. Great questions, but um, don't have access to that kind of information. Less involved on the higher kind of level, more involved on the kind of volunteer level. Yeah, um, we did just um, as as on a related note, um, we did have conversations to see how we can collaborate with school nurses, especially around the wellness check piece, and I think that's something that. Um, is an area of work that's still kind of being stood up within uh, the volunteer course, uh, volunteer core. Um, but as, as all of us, as, as we've been thinking about how, how this academic public health volunteer core will um, become further institutionalized and really continue to evolve, I think one of the key opportunities is to really make sure that we um, broaden the collaboration to engage all of the different sectors of health professions because there's really um, a lots, lots of really important opportunities. And I think school nurses are a key part of those collaborations. All right, so our next question is from Martin Donovan um, and it's about the, the role of a contact tracer being um, as a volunteer position as well. This question is just wondering how does one sustain uh, economically if you're working on the COVID-19 contact tracing as a volunteer? Um, that's a great question. Um, for me, I'm still a student. So I am subsisting on my financial aid. <laughs> um, um, I'm actually in classes all summer as well. So I think, I think honestly connected to this question, but I think probably more of an issue for those of us who are in school year round um, is how we are balancing um, being volunteers as well as our coursework and um, maybe other student teaching assistant or research assistant positions. Um, it's not easy, but it's doable. Um, I think I focus a lot of my volunteer time making calls on weekends. Um, and I'm just trying, I try to be realistic, um, about what I sign up to do to volunteer so that I'm not having anyone rely on me volunteering, <laughs> um, on a certain day when I might not actually be able to. Yeah, I think similar to Cassie, uh, I work full time, uh, so I only volunteer between like two and four hours a week, um, to kind of uh, help along like with the process, uh, but it's definitely not my like full-time um, uh, kind of position, uh, which I guess works kind of well, because I feel like I usually call people after like my work hours, like five or six, which is usually the time that people pick up calls since they're also out of work hours. Um, so I guess it just kind of is about balancing um, what we do either as alumni or students, uh, but then also kind of um, working kind of as like a team, because uh, if everyone does one or two hours of calling a week, then we're, we can make a lot of calls as like a very large group of volunteers. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, consolidate a couple of questions here. A number of attendees have some really great questions about confidentiality, um, resistance to or fear into people asking about personal information, um, you know, there's also a note about an increasing report of fraudulent or scam calls on the news that may be impacting these efforts. And, um, you know, just kind of um, 
how are you addressing, you know, whether it's resistance to this effort or um, fear around sharing confidential information? That's a really great question. Um, and you do find a lot of folks that are reluctant to give you information um, for fear of privacy issues and things like that. Um, I think one of the most important things to do in, in that case is just really explain what the purpose of your work is and what the purpose of your call is. Oftentimes when you explain the purpose of contact tracing efforts, um, people do begin to feel a sense of responsibility. And like I talked about before, that sort of camaraderie in their ability to protect others. Um, and that's, you know, when that happens, that's a wonderful thing to hear. In my own experience with resource coordination, I've also found that a lot of folks um, who are undocumented um, are very reluctant to give information. Um, and unfortunately, they're often people who need resources more than others. Um, and so it, you, you have to be very delicate in addressing that topic um, because people often don't wanna share whether they're undocumented or not. Um, and so you really have to be um, dedicated to their comfort um, in that, in those cases, in order to get people resources that they can access um, while still being respectful of what they wish to share with you, um, especially when it comes to their documentation status. Um, and that's a challenge that we're kind of continuing to address and we're changing the way we address those situations in order to protect people um, and make sure that they feel comfortable when you are serving them. Matt, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. I don't know if Cassie has anything to add, but I feel like confidentiality and privacy issues is something that's super important, especially as we're giving people kind of their results uh, of a test that um, they definitely want to hear the results for. Um, I think, I kind of mentioned this before, I think there's a lot of anxiety that comes with kind of waiting for your result. And I think the biggest issue that we've kind of, or biggest like barrier that we keep getting uh, is like um, trying to make calls and people kind of want their results back and like, their sisters and their grandmas and everyone's, uh, which we can't do because of kind of uh, private. Trying to mitigate um, conversations like that, uh, where we can kind of only give your like a person's like test results back and not kind of everyone else that is related to them, uh, which kind of makes them kind of stressed out and anxious because uh, I think they usually tend to think that's probably the worst uh, kind of case scenario. Um, so I think it's kind of difficult and trying to kind of um, mitigate that is difficult. Um, but we usually have either weekly or bi weekly calls as like a good team of like 30 volunteers. So we're going to have that space to kind of talk about how we uh, manage those kind of conflicts uh, and kind of how to move forward like with like the best like next steps. Yeah, I think Magda just um, nailed it in terms of our role as a volunteer. Someone did just ask about um, documented versus undocumented. So I just really quickly wanted to clear that up in case um, anyone else had that question. Documentation refers to a person's immigration status. So um, someone who is documented would have um, a visa to be in the United States versus someone who is undocumented um, would not necessarily have refugee status or visa status. So that's what we mean. Um, so people are reluctant to share that information for fear of deportation. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, everybody so much for these amazing questions. So the next question we have is um, from Ray Ray Green and it kind of touches on many of the things that we've discussed here today, but um, you know, for Meredith, Magda and Cassie, through your experience so far, just kind of, can you maybe propose some suggestions for how we could make contact tracing better? And specifically, how can we get to some of the populations which don't have as much access to COVID-19 information, whether it be through language barriers, literacy issues, um, you know, things like that. Uh, what are your organizations doing to try to address these challenges? That's a really great point to bring up. Um, and I think local, health departments and local healthcare workers uh, play a huge role in the dissemination of information um, to groups that may be otherwise difficult to reach. Um, when populations are difficult to reach, you really need people who are able to um, have that cultural competency, have that linguistic knowledge in order to um, 
convey information effectively to populations that may be difficult to reach, especially for cultural or language reasons. Um, that is often something that kind of goes beyond what volunteers can do and what care resource coordinators and contact tracers in the CTC can do. And that's often escalated to um, more local healthcare workers in local health departments. And they can do a really great job of accessing um, and getting in contact with those kinds of populations. Something that um, I've seen personally just in my neighborhood walking around that I think might be helpful is um, there are a lot of like yard signs and signs up at parks about um, where to get information about COVID-19, um, what websites you can go to to learn about testing, about social distancing, et cetera. And everyone has been in at least two or three languages. So I think deploying more information around communities and around neighborhoods in the languages that are um, spoken by the people who live there can be really helpful. Yeah, I think that I love both of Meredith and Kathy's point. Um, I think like over our arching kind of theme, I keep kind of saying it's like the fact that we really need to collaborate more um, on the best way to tackle all of this, uh, working with CDC and the volunteer corps. I know we had questions about working with school nurses because uh, I feel like everyone kind of has something to bring to the table. Um, and I think both Cassie and Kunamir, this kind of touched on like kind of best next steps or like ways to um, move forward um, with trying to mitigate a global pandemic. And also another uh, really important thing we can do is how do we bring those vulnerable populations into our work? How do mm -hmm. we bring those hard to reach populations into what we're doing? Um, because suddenly when you have people who are linguistically and culturally competent, those populations aren't hard to reach anymore. So, you know, relating to some of our previous questions about diversity in our workforce, um, when we continue to diversify our workforce and, and we bring new people um, with new backgrounds and, and new identities into our work, populations aren't difficult to reach anymore. Um, and so addressing issues of that nature often um, should start in your organization in the work that you're doing. All right, so our next question is from, um, it's specific to contact tracing and the practice of it, and uh, it's from Heather Ferrand, and she asks, I'm curious how you are conducting contact tracing, not only for the individuals who get tested, but as you mentioned, the other individuals that were in contact with that person. Um, also, I'm aware of a contact tracing function on the iPhone. How does that communicate with local slash state um, boards of health or departments of public health? Um, so I, I may be misunderstanding the question, but um, is the question about um, getting in contact with cases and then also getting in contact with their, their contacts? Um, because the way that works, um, just from a, a workflow standpoint, is uh, a case investigator will get in contact with a case um, and the case will then tell um, the case investigator who they've been in contact with um, for 15 minutes or more within six feet. Um, in the days around um, their positive test. Um, and then a contact tracer will then call all of those contacts. So it's kind of like a, a twofold sort of thing where a case is contacted and then all of their contacts are then contacted. Um, so at least in the CTC, there are two different roles. So there's case investigators and contact tracers who are both doing um, those separate roles. Um, I believe that's addressing the question that was asked. I don't think I can add to Meredith's, um, I guess, point, uh, maybe because I feel like uh, my work as a volunteer has been less involved with the next steps of contact tracing, but more um, kind of case interviewing, um, case management, and then providing people with their test results. Um, all right, great. So then the next question um, is um, from somebody who has participated in contact tracing and their question is that I found that case info is not often current. Is there a way to improve contact info at the testing site? Can we collect additional info or contact info for cases since many were in hospitals? And could we improve or have standardized computer um, programs or apps to, for data collection and analysis?
Um, in terms of information not being current, um, with the CTC in particular, the information that um, contact tracers, case investigators, um, and care resource coordinators have access to is from MAVEN, um, which is a, a state data system. Um, so if information from that system is inaccurate or incomplete, um, that's an issue that's kind of occurred um, towards the beginning of that process with that case or contact. Um, so improvements would have to be made at that point um, rather um, than at the CTC or, or the volunteer core level. Um, so I'm not sure how you would solve that issue, but it would have to occur sort of higher up um, than the three of us are at currently. Um, yeah, as a data analyst, I love questions about data quality. It gets me very excited. Um, I think uh, we have been kind of running into issues in terms of the data that we receive from the Somerville Health Department when giving people the results back, as in either people were um, contacting multiple times, we're trying to slow down, slow down our process. There's no need to contact someone, someone multiple times with their test results, uh, or people being able to access uh, the results through like electronic um, methods like MyChart, which once again kind of slows down um, us in terms of the volume of calls that we're trying to get through. Uh, so right now we're working with the health department to kind of uh, make that process a little bit, run a little bit smoother so that we're able to make uh, an, an efficient number of calls and not kind of be slowed down in that process. But it's a really great question. Yeah, I've seen a few times as well um, when I've gone to call people that the phone numbers are actually not in service or people's voicemails are full, um, which are two separate issues. Um, what we do in that case is we make a note of it and that information goes back to um, the clinic that did the testing and hopefully they have more information or can clarify or fix any of the contact information for us. Um, but like Meredith said, I'm not super um, sure what happens at the higher level when that happens. All right, so I think we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, the next is from Elizabeth Parent, who says, I work in a public school, and I was wondering if it is the responsibility of a parent or a minor, of a parent of a minor in the public school to notify the school of a positive COVID result to assist in contact tracing of peers or the local board of health. That's a good question. Neil, you can take this one. I'm really not sure. <laughs> I, yeah, um, I mean, from the volunteer core perspective, that's something that we're still figuring out is um, because our work the, from the with the volunteer core, um, the volunteers are are really working in response to what the local boards of health are identifying as their as their core needs. And I do suspect that as there's been a lot of focus on reopening and uh, focus on policies and things like that related to reopenings that the volunteers have been assisting with. But I think with schools, it's probably going to be the next phase of activity is to really start to think about um, schools and policies around schools. And um, the contact tracing, Meredith, I, I'll yield to you in terms of is the CTC, is this something that the CTC is focusing on in terms of contact tracing with uh, the schools and, um, and offering those services to schools? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, primarily because the data that we have access to in our system is again from MAVEN, which is a state data system. So if you test positive in Massachusetts, um, that's a reportable um, illness. So you get your information gets added into MAVEN, um, which then um, can be shared with employees of the CTC through um, our technology. So really the only funnel for information that I have um, you know, been exposed to it is through that sort of system. So um, I think unless other channels of information through school districts is created, um, you know, we don't, we can't do anything specifically with schools right now. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that's in the works. It might be. Um, uh, but again, I really only know of that sort of one funnel of information when it comes to positive test results. Okay. Great, thank you. Crosby, I'm not sure if we have time for any more questions or if I should. I was gonna say, we're just about at time. Um, I can feed a general one or if you have any final remarks, um, you know, just be respectful of everybody's time, we can start closing up. 
yeah, I'm happy to just kind of close. Um, I did want to just um, again thank um, Magda, Meredith, Cassie, uh, you've all all three of you for the amazing work that you've done. Um, you've all kind of really uh, not only answered the call to action, but it's been amazing. Um, we had so many students um, volunteer for this effort and volunteer while completing coursework, while making this transition during COVID to everything going online. And um, in the midst of all of that chaos, uh, really dedicating yourselves to this work. And I think it really speaks to the commitment of Bouvet College students and alumni to really promoting and protecting the health of our communities. Um, it was such an extraordinary a response and continues to be an extraordinary response. And I'm just so deeply grateful. This volunteer corps would have, um, this entire idea would have fallen flat on its face were it not for um, all of your energy and experience um, and, uh, and effort to make this happen. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you again, everybody, to um, our presenters and speakers and all of your attendees. Um, thank you so much for all of the wonderful questions. The recording will be circulated following this program. Um, and with that, we'll let you get back to the rest of your afternoons. But thank you again so much for everybody for attending. Thank you.